one Pacific Islander to another one. Uh, Did you? Let me take a different, uh, a different stance so that this doesn't end up as a boring meeting. Uh, <coughs> you know, Kiribati has the 12th largest segment of ocean space in the entire world. Uh, the last figure I saw was approximately 3.5 million square miles. It's actually 3.441810 square miles. So you have a lot of territory. I mean, we intellectually tend to conceptualize uh, territory only as land. The world's changing. With a country as small as Kiribati is, with your population 160,000 and 310 square miles of land, you have an enormous territory located in a very strategic spot in the world. That's one of the reasons why you broke relations with China and now have diplomatic relations with Taiwan. Taiwan. It was a strategic security issue that led you in that direction. So that said, um, Mr. President, that said, um, and considering your be present bent that more than likely you're going to have to move like the people of R Rambi did eventually. Uh, by the way, footnote here, I happened to work in a top security position in Australia in the 70s for the Whitlam government. I saw the secret papers on the negotiations between the Nauruans and the Australians and the New Zealanders. If you have time, drop by the house and I'll tell you what happened. <laughs> uh, if nothing else, we can share some color with you. <laughs> and maybe some breadfruit if you're really nice. <laughs> but, you know, I think you're going to have to move. I wrote a paper in 1990 that was published by Oxford University Press, predicting more or less, you know, sometimes I think I should never have been a Pacific historian, I should have been a prophet. Maybe there would be more money in that. <laughs> but, you know, as early as 1990, I recognized that this is the likely scenario that was going to occur, particularly for atolls. You're not a high island, you're an atoll. So, I think you're going to have to move. And I think buying land in Fiji is good public policy. It's a good backup position. Um, I don't think you're going to get the kind of support that you want from Australia. Fundamentally, Australia is very rac racist at the top. And I say that having cut my intellectual teeth in Australia, I've got a PhD in Australia. So, and I worked at the apex of the Australian government. There is very little hope in Australia, I think. And you know, don't get edgy. You know, I'm a member of the public, you know, don't get edgy. The president is a, is a, is a what did you say you were, a radical what? Or was it the yes. adjective before the radical? Yes. Yeah, yes. you know, we can hold out, we can, I can hold my own in this stage here. So, you know, I don't think you should have too much confidence in Australia. They're not going to come to your assistance. Australia is a brutal, racist society, let me tell you. I mean, that doesn't mean to say that all of them are, but at the, at, the, at the apex of the political structure in Australia, they're fundamentally racist, and they've been that way for a long time. Labor, eh, they're a little bit softer, but don't expect anything from the Liberal Country Party Coalition. New Zealand, New Zealand got its own problems. New Zealand got its own problems dealing with Maori land issues and Maori resources. Don't forget, you are in a permanent colony here in Hawaii. This is a permanent colony of the United States. It's a state. If you want to talk about colonialism, you know, let's have a, let's have a decent discussion about colonialism. Landlessness is at the fundamental root of problems of the native Hawaiian people. If you don't believe me, ask them. Okay. So, all of that said, all of that said, I don't think you should expect too much support from the United States. You're in the wrong country at this time. 
Things may change in 2020. I doubt it. But I don't think you're going to get any... Uh, uh, if you're looking for money... Wait a minute, wait a minute. Look, wait a minute, wait a minute. Hold it, okay? Hold it. I'm not going to take instructions from you. Look. Look. We need... No, I need for you to shut up. Okay, for a minute. So, Mr. Seven President, o'clock. now that this is getting interesting, why don't, look, don't touch me, sit down. No, yeah, sit. You sit, sit down. Sit, down. sit, sit. Mr. So Mr. Just, President, I'm step in here you, I, I, what I am saying to you before this crowd gets at my throat, let, uh, what I'm saying to you is for you to expect even anything approaching a substantial amount of money to address the problems of the people of Kiribati. You're fundamentally in the wrong country. But you know, you're a world traveler, you've been around, you beat the bushes, time is running out on you, but time is running out on all of us. Ew. Under, against that wordy background, I'd like to have your comments. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you Anthony. Don't touch me. Get away from me. That's okay. Then, uh, yes, I'm listening. Let me try to answer that very long question. Yes. <laughs> You know, I, I totally agree with you, but I, uh, we are, we were, small, we were a small country mm-hmm. until we came to realize that we are a huge ocean state mm-hmm. with huge, huge resources. And I don't know what you've heard about the commentary, but let me, it's a, it's a fact that one of the previous prime ministers of Australia said, yes, we would welcome the people from the Pacific, but in exchange, we, we would have access to their fish resources. Yeah. Now, our fish resources are worth billions and billions of dollars. But the moment we only get 10% of the value on the side of the wolf before it's processed. So we're getting a very tiny part. Okay? Again, that makes us still a colony, a supplier of raw material to the rest of to the developed world. We're going to change that. And that's the point that I was making. With the partnership of people, not necessarily governments, we can do it. And we need to do it in order to build our climate resilience so that we do not expect any funding from the international community, from any country, because we would not need it. So we need to restructure this relationship. So I think, in a sense, I hope I've answered your question. I've, I've come here, in fact, when I had the encounter with the Minister of Environment in Australia in October, she said, Oh, you've come for the money. Huh? But they wait for me, I'll sign my check. Very insulting. And uh, of course, I pretended not to hear, but my colleagues couldn't take it, and they took it to Parliament. They wrote to the Prime Minister, too. And it was debated in Parliament. Now, as I was leaving, as I was leaving on my way from Melbourne to Brisbane, as I walked out of Melbourne, at the Melbourne airport, there was a, a camera crew. And they asked me the question, oh, we haven't, we haven't seen the Minister of Environment, she seems to be missing in action. But remember that he was, she was rude to you sometime last year. And so I said, why did I, you ask me, come on, surely you don't believe I have anything to do with your disappearance? <laughs> <laughs> but you're right. We could not put our entire trust, which means the survival of our people, in one single source of assistance. It would be better if we could rely the resource that we have in abundance, but which we need to do approach its exploitation in a different way. Thank you for those comments.